Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. The three of us have written a book. It's called Dreamwise, Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams. And we're so proud of having written it. And we're thrilled that it's going to be out in the world soon. It will be available on November 12th. So we encourage you to pre-order it now. You can go to our brand new, beautiful new website, dreamwisebook.com. And if you pre-ordered the book, you can claim a free PDF to help with dream recall. Also on the site, there's information about our Dreamography project. For the next 12 months, we're going to be exploring a different type of dream. And this month, to kick it off, we're looking at dog dreams. And that's what today's episode is about. So we got lots of wonderful submissions about dog dreams. Today, we're going to talk about the archetype of the dog and look at, at as many examples as possible of how dogs show up in dreams. And then we'll have a blog post about it, including we'll publish some of the many fine examples that we got so that you can look at the different ways that dogs show up in dreams. Next up, we're looking at wedding dreams. So you can head over to dreamwisebook.com and click on dreamography and share your wedding dream for our November 2024 episode. So without further ado, Let's talk about dogs and how they show up in dreams. So, I mean, the the first thing that's so important is that dogs have been part of the human experience for just an enormous amount of times. And there's a lot of interesting anthropologic, archaeologic interest Mm -hmm. in what is it about humans and dogs? Yeah, they've kind of co evolved. They've they've co evolved. And interestingly, one theory is that when human communities became large enough and sophisticated enough to create trash dumps, (laughs) truly, that a certain species of canine discovered that as a resource. And so they would follow uh, the humans and, in a sense, slowly become dependent on them. There's another really interesting piece of research that was done, I think, in Russia they were taking wild foxes and they were breeding them. And what they would do is that they would prioritize foxes that were naturally less aggressive towards humans. And then they would rebreed the less aggressive um, foxes. And the more they rebred them, the more they started to look like dogs, modern dogs. So it's this, there's something really interesting about this relationship between this wild creature and humans. Right. And here is a link, you know, in dogs, maybe to some extent cats, but our link with the instinctual realm of the animal with its uh, acute smell, hearing, and more, uh, and domesticity. And I'm just thinking about the, the dogs that we had as as pets and absolutely fully fledged members of the family, oh, yeah. and m- how many people, millions upon millions, we love our dogs. They love us, and we dream about them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean the 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 relationship between a person mm. and their dog can be so profound and so soulful and. Don't worry, we'll probably also do cat dreams too. So <laughs> hang on, cat lovers. But, but dogs, they protect us. They work for us. They love us. And uh, it's an incredibly soulful experience to have that kind of relationship with a dog. And, you know, I don't know about you, but it's, it is so common that dog dreams come into my practice. People a lot of times dream about their own dog or maybe a dog from childhood. Yes. But sometimes dogs appear in in a more mythological fashion as well. And I think 
you know, as you were saying, Deb, dogs have such acute senses that they're a really wonderful um, symbol for, for an ability to sniff out things in the unconscious. And they bridge the realms. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the world of instinct, uh, unconscious uh, powers that we don't possess as humans. Uh, and they're our companions and live in our homes. And so they link us to realms of, of wildness in um, a really friendly kind of way. And, uh, and they're also uh, the guides of our souls. Mm-hmm. They, they are the guides to the underworld in mythology. Uh, the psychopomps who bridge the realms from the underworld to above ground, uh, from life to death, from consciousness to unconscious, uh, and provide that kind of really important uh, linking function. And as we look at the dog from a mythic and historical standpoint, the sentimental attitude towards dogs is fairly modern. Hmm. That dogs have Actually, dogs chose humans. Humans didn't chose use dogs. Mm-hmm. Dogs mm-hmm. discovered, for instance, human refuse, and they right. just kept following along. Then in the ancient world, dogs were not, for the most part, lap dogs, that they were part of the working environment, that they were allies, um, that they were not held with the same kind of... Um, child parent dynamic to which we have in the modern world and love so much by the way the dog to become our babies i have to say that that's new and in part that has to do with kind of socioeconomic resources you know one or two generations ago it's 1930 1920 you had enough food for your family that you weren't getting special food for your dog your dog kind of lived outside and loved you, protected you, but was much more in the realm of that wild um, aspect. We've domesticated them beautifully so, and I've loved my dogs. But when we start thinking about how they show up in dreams and how show up in mythology, I think we need to understand how much more in the wild that the energy of the dog really is, one foot there and one foot with us. Or one paw, excuse me. (laughs) (laughs) Before we move on to uh, sort of a mythological discussion, and then we'll get to the dreams, I just actually want to share a dog story from sort of personal mythology, which is a story that my dad has told me from his childhood. So my dad grew up in North Georgia, which is rattlesnake country. And uh, they had a dog. I can't remember the dog's name, but my dad still remembers it. And that dog was my, my dad's companion as he traipsed all over the farm. It was, you know, acres and acres. So he's walking through the woods one day and the dog is behind him. And then the dog, for whatever reason, gets up in front of him. And a few feet later, a rattlesnake jumps out and bites the dog. And so it, oh would, have my been, gosh. it would have been my dad who would have been bitten if it hadn't been for the dog. Now, the dog, if I recall the story, (laughs) the dog was okay. They were, they were able to uh, treat it and, and the dog was okay if I remember. So it's a happy ending, but just this remarkable thing. My dad has always felt like the dog had a sense and did it to save him. So it's a, it's a, it's just a great story. Oh, it's a wonderful story. And uh, ironically enough, it takes me to the flip side that we haven't talked about yet, of dogs in their more ferocious attacking guise of your dad's dog attacked uh, or was going to attack the snake. Dogs have been used in warfare. Um, guard dogs, uh, we've all seen photos of you know, German shepherds and other big dogs. German shepherds scare me. <laughs> well. And so there it is of uh, the dog that can be harnessed for protective and, if necessary, lethal uh, wounding of 
a, a presumed en- enemy. Sure. And dogs every year, they, they maul and kill a certain number of people. I don't have statistics on that, mm-hmm. but that is not unheard of. Mm-hmm. You know, wa- walking in a neighborhood, for example, where people don't fence or chain their dogs and the dog comes leaping out at you, it's very, it's very unnerving. It, it, you know, you feel really threatened when a dog does that. There was a famous movie in 1988 called um, Cry in the Dark that stars uh, Meryl Streep, which was taken from a terrible, tragic trial in Australia where a couple was camping. They turned around and a wild dingo oh, right. had taken their baby. And uh, because the mother was traumatized and kind of stony, she was prosecuted because she couldn't convince people that actually. An animal had run off with the with the child. Oh God! So, yes, dogs are amazing in so many areas of the instinctive, the wild, the companion, the loved one, the boy's best friend. The incredible range of feelings and qualities. I think most importantly that dogs can embody and do embody. And uh, dogs were used in the Deep South to hunt slaves that had run Mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And so there is kind of enormous cultural trauma um, in the South about setting the dogs upon someone that is still a a terrifying remnant for some people. And still today with um, something like escaped prisoners or uh, with set the dogs out. Um, And there is something very terrifying about that. Uh, As I imagine, there must be for the fox and the traditional fox hunt Mm -hmm. thing where the Mm -hmm. hounds are baying and pursuing uh, in a way that is um, almost Dionysian in in the ecstasy uh, that the dog experiences and the people experience right alongside i'm sure yes yeah. exactly mm-hmm. so they can link yeah, the us. fever of the hunt right exactly and they can inspire that in us and and that brings up what happened to actaeon right when he spied ah. uh, artemis bathing and she did not like that and she turned him into a stag and his own dogs uh ripped him limb to limb mm. And there you are in the ancient world where dogs were not um, lap dogs, right. that they were powerful allies to humans, but they were in their own right fierce and dangerous and skilled, and they were hunters and protectors. Yeah. yeah. So what do we make of uh, what dogs have become in a more modern era with, I don't know how many different breeds that are shown in dog shows, and the number of times that we have all, in any town that I uh, go into now, it seems, people are wheeling their dogs around in strollers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I think the, the beautiful plasticity of the archetype of the dog is um, how malleable the, the idea of the dog can be. You know, if it's, it's 1940 and you're, you're on a farm, a dog is malleable enough to leave out in the field, and if you raise them with sheep, it'll think it's a sheep, and it'll extend all its protective ferocity and drive wolves away. In the modern era, where we're not living on farms, most of us aren't, but we still have a need, the need to feel loved by and to love and care for something that will return our affection with enormous enthusiasm and companionship. We need a companion. Dogs are malleable, and we can shape them into being our loving babies and our ever-enthusiastic, innocent toddlers that live in our homes. So the remarkable story is dogs seem to become what we need in a given time and space. I think that is really interesting and really important that dogs take on our projections for what we, what we need. Mm-hmm. And they change mm-hmm. in response to that. As we treat our dogs, we breed them a couple of different ways to make them into sweet little babies. Right. And we have 
you know, these little Tibetan dogs that they would hide in the <laughs> sleeves of their robes that would just live with them, to, these little Tibetan lap dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, so they become, they become what we want and what we need over and over and over again, which is, when I say it that way, it sounds a little <laughs> intense, right? You know, <laughs> And they're still animal and other. They are, and, and they so are there is that. that sense of being, uh, being allied in a having a deep connection with with uh, with an instinctual being, even if it's a little lap dog. And they tolerate um, these multiple iterations of breedings. Not all creatures also have such a malleable genetic dance mm-hmm. that respond to all kinds of varieties. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose it's our interest in combining and recombining. And now the, uh, the doodling of American dogs, you know, you're taking poodles and, and breeding them with uh, Labradors and their oh, Labradoodles <laughs> and, and right. uh, <laughs> Burmese mountain dogs and, you know, oh, Burma so doodles. Um, what are they called? What are they called? Burma doodles. No, I have not seen that. Yeah. My sister just got one. So, uh, and then now again, um, the incredible plasticity of their own genetic code mm. among various species. You know, Chihuahuas yeah. and Burmese mountain dogs can be bred yeah. t- together <laughs> and produce Ugh. all kinds of interesting things. Um, so this incredible amount of varieties and traits. And dogs are responsive to that. And of course, they're responsive to our imaginations. They possibilize things in the human imagination. I, I'm thinking about the, 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 the little archetypal energy that they carry. And I'm, I'm thinking about being in, say, a crowded train station. And the gendarme comes along with a German shepherd tightly held on a leash. And that, you know, that dog is sniffing around and you know he's sniffing for drugs or bombs or whatever. And it, you know, it just gives me a little thrill of my spine. It, there's something numinous about that particular dog energy for me. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and I, I think that they're, they're so remarkable. Uh, you know, they can, they, there's some research that shows that they can scent, they can detect cancer in, in the urine of sufferers long before other tests can. And, and that, that, is, that is where it feels like it's, this is something, oh, this is not something human. This is something really other. Of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with, you know, uh, reading into people uh, the characteristics of the dog they choose to own. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that the guards and police uh, in train stations, you know, they're with German shepherds. What about the person who's walking a Yorkie? Yeah, <laughs> that's so uh, you cute. Know, and, and you know, and so it goes. Yeah. Uh, you know, we read something something into that, and uh, you know, I've heard it said that um, people look like their dogs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, so it says something about our own psychology of of here's my pet dog, and which one is it? You know, is it a husky? Is it a bloodhound? Is it a water dog? Right. Or or is it a little teacup poodle? Right. (laughs) So, Deb, you brought up before the fact that dogs and mythology are often psychopomps or guides of souls, and in a very particular way, too, because dogs are often in mythology universally in, in just about every single culture. The dog is either a guardian of the underworld or uh, he who guides the souls of the dead to the underworld. So I'm thinking, of course, of Cerberus, the three-headed dog of Greek mythology, who stands guard at the, the entrance to the underworld, to Hades. And uh, there's also, in Norse mythology, there's a, a dog named Garm, who guards Niflheim. In Aztec mythology, there's Zolotl, And so Lottel was a dog-headed man who accompanied the sun on his journey into darkness every day and also served 
to to guide souls to the underworld and uh you know it's it's in it's in lots of other mythologies too i know joseph yeah you're you're pretty versed in in egyptian mythology yes uh, i think anubis is a, a remarkable and wonderful um, image and particularly along the lines that we're talking about having uh, the archetype of the dog has a foot in more than one world. Mm -hmm. In the evolution of God images, which Jung talks about in Ion, we go from, uh, as, as humanity, worshipping animals, and then we go to this worshipping of animal-human hybrids. So with Anubis, we have a human body, but the head of an animal. And that captures some of the things that we've been talking about, that there is some part of our psyche that thinks of dogs as human and dog-like. And, and that's captured very much in the, uh, well, in the jackal-headed, not dog-headed, but jackal-headed uh, creatures. So Anubis was really important in Egyptian cosmology, that he was connected to death and to burial and the afterlife. And Anubis was the protector of tombs and graves. And if we remember in the ancient world, if your body was buried, animals could dig it up. Sure. And of course, uh, robbers could rob um, the things that had been buried, which was considered a horrific violation because the dead needed these objects that had been apportioned to them. So Anubis was the archetype of who will guard us when we are so vulnerable, when we're returned to that state in the underworld of being swaddled and baby-like as we are in the grave, that we need, psychologically, we need to feel that something is going to protect us when we are in that deep deep, quiet place. By the way, one of the places I've seen this in my practice over and again is that when people fall into an enormous depression, often their dog is the absolute lifeline for them. It's the thing that will never leave them, that is always happy to see them. And if you're suicidal, you think, I can't kill myself because then what would happen to my dog? So there is a way in which even now, Anubis is with you when you go into the psychological grave and protects you and, and it companions you. Anubis was one of many gods guiding the souls of the dead to Hades. So we can understand this in a way. In the ancient, in the ancient world, there were no street lamps, no flashlights, and if you had a candle, you weren't really going to be able to take that on a mile walk between houses or farms. Very few modern folks have ever been outdoors at a time when it was so dark you could not see your hand in front of your face. And the first time I experienced that when I was camping with the Boy Scouts, I, I, it had never, I didn't even know it was possible to be in a darkness where I could not see my hand an inch from my face. Joseph. It's, you were, it's very you were in the Boy Scouts? I loved the Boy Scouts. All right, that's I, another story for great. another time, but I'm yes. putting the bookmark there. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so if you needed to be outdoors, both in terms of being protected, but also what could find the way from your house to the barn even, you would tie a rope to your dog. and You wouldn't just hold the rope. You would tie the rope to you. Because if you drop that rope and the dog goes off running somewhere, you're out of luck. And you would depend 100% on your dog being able to see in such low light to get you to the barn or the neighbor's house and also to spy out danger. So what a perfect um, mythologic figure to take you into the darkest of dark places, which would be Hades. And the underworld. Anubis also, for reasons that I can't quite wrap my head around, but aided um, Isis in both finding the 
secrets of resurrection and aiding her in resurrecting Osiris. The last bit that I would say, which I think we can all identify with, is that in the symbolism of Osiris, after he has died and been resurrected, that he resides in the underworld in the hole of Mat, and he decides which of the souls of the dead Mm. will be eaten and disposed of, and which of the souls of the dead will be allowed to move into an eternal life. And so the heart of the dead is put on the scale, and on one side is the heart, and the other is the feather of Mat, which is truth. But the one who holds the scale is Anubis. Mm -hmm. And so it is a really interesting idea that Will you, at the end of your life, have a heart that is like your dog's, that Mm -hmm. is that faithful, that loving, that forgiving, that loyal, that enthusiastic? Or will will your heart be something else? Mm -hmm. Uh, And and so this is maybe where it's we can start to move into the dream material because if you think about all of these qualities that we've been talking about with dogs. You know, part of what they symbolize is the dog sense in us, mm-hmm. the, the, the unconscious perception that can see into the dark or can, can sense the true quality of another person's character. Mm-hmm. And so the dog is a tremendous symbol for our own instincts and intuition. And ongoing relatedness. Almost no matter what, the, the loyalty, connection, companioning, faithfulness, uh, you know, dogs by and large are good-hearted. Mm-hmm. And, the and protect- that, that helps their souls weigh less, <laughs> less than a feather. Yes. <laughs> and they are also the protector of the psyche. Yeah. That, that we wish we had internalized dogs so that when we're in situations that don't smell right, where somebody looks aggressive, something mm-hmm. in us, it'd be nice if something in us just growled a little bit. Yeah. It's like, mm, <laughs> I don't know about that car salesman. Mm. <laughs> you know, it'd be oh, nice Joseph. to feel a little of that. <laughs> you can tell I have, a, I have quite a inner dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and our ability to, you know, similarly to sniff things out. So here goes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. You get to come right up. It proves that easy to choose a mate. Yeah. <laughs> Smells <Yes>. okay to me. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going there. <laughs> well, let's. So we got so many great dog dreams, and it was just really hard to pick. I mean, just everyone was was really great. There's a couple themes. Uh, I think I think we have four that we'll go into with a little more depth. But let, let's just. I'm just going to read a couple. We're, we're only going to maybe comment briefly on some of these. But but here's one. Um, This one comes from a woman who's 50 years old. Uh, I'm inside somewhere and there's a wood burning stove. My dog is with me and either she's trying to do something with a heat or I've asked her to do something with a heat, but she puts her front paws inside a pile of ash and embers below the stove and burns both paws. My husband gives me a paste to put on the wounds, but I don't use it. I'm alarmed that she burned herself, but I just watch her. My husband then takes the paste and begins applying it to her wounds. I know that she's in pain. I think about all the dogs that burn up in house fires, and I'm sad for them because it would be a very painful way to go. Our dog yelps a bit as we apply the balm, and I think that maybe we should also bandage her paws so they can heal and not get stuff stuck in the balm. And, uh... Yeah, so so she notes that she had this dream three days after her 50th birthday, and the birthday felt significant to her, and she had been sad because she hadn't felt celebrated by her husband. So any quick thoughts about this one? We're just going to brush over it a bit. What I'm wondering about here just from the very beginning um, is that the dog is trying to do something with the heat yeah. or, or I've asked her to do something with the heat. Is the dog taking the heat somehow? Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 
uh, the dog part of her willing to take the heat and uh, the injury. Uh, and a 50th birthday is a big, it's a big milestone. It's a yeah. big one. And uh, she had not I felt... wouldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was so oh, long ago. Oh, mine was just a year or so ago, so it's <laughs> still vivid. <laughs> but, uh, but that, that, but that, that's it. The uh, part of her is taking the heat for where she felt burned by the inattentiveness to her on this milestone birthday. And then, and then the the husband is trying to effect a repair yes. somehow. Yeah. Yeah. So if I think of the dream as, as a medicine, not simply just reflecting her known experience, that the dream is also saying, you had something to do with feeling burned. That mm -hmm. you asked your dog to investigate the heat. The dog is also part of you. So your instincts are off because a dog wouldn't stick its paws in, mm -hmm. you know, and live coals. Mm -hmm. So where might have you pushed your psyche into something that's going to burn you so that the husband then becomes alarmed and then has to tend you as if you are wounded? Yeah. And that can be a really complicated behavior that, that we do to get attention Mm -hmm. because we don't feel like we're being seen as well as we wished we had. Yeah. So the dream is offering a, a tricky thing. A way of making the wound visible. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. That, you know, we have hurt feelings or whatever, those are inside. And if we manifest something, uh, as the dream does, as an external bodily injury of how do we make it obvious? How do we make it visible so, so as to get tending and care? And she's rather indifferent to what's happened. We don't have a sense that she is horrified mm -hmm. the way somebody might be if they saw something or you saw your baby getting mm -hmm. near something dangerous. You'd be flying across the room, of course. She's just kind of there watching. It happens. But, but, you know, I think this dream is a good example of a type where the dog kind of represents a tender, innocent part of us. And, and that comes up a lot. So let's, mm -hmm. let's look at another one. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, Weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind the scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, the next one is a woman who's 34 years old. She says, I'm in the hallway of my childhood home. Around the corner of the hallway, you can see the back door. The whole door is of window panels. It is night and dark in the house. And I find myself feeling terrified and looking around the corner to the back door. I see the clown from it staring hungrily back at me through the window panels. I immediately hide back in the hallway. I think about my childhood golden retriever buddy in the backyard with a killer mm. clown. I later gather enough courage to look back at the door and there is no clown. I am somehow brave enough to tiptoe up to the door and peer through the panels looking for my furry friend. There he is, laying down on the back deck. He doesn't notice me, but he looks tired and old. I am more than relieved and deeply comforted to see him there. Again, so just quickly, what do we what do we think of this one? Mm. I mean, this this shows something really common happens in a lot of dreams where their childhood dog appears. What I think is so important here is that it is is like a, a horrifying fantasy from a film. Yeah, and dogs marvelously being more instinctive are as neurotic as we are. <laughs> so like. 
we can, good. we can be having a horrifying that's fantasy good. of like some clown coming out of a sewer right. that's actually a monster <laughs> and your dog's like, oh, go to sleep. Oh, just stop already. Well, I just, just want to say <laughs> some dogs are less neurotic, right? That's there good. are neurotic dogs. But I really like that, Joseph, that your your instincts, like your ego can get all spun up, right? Yeah. And, and neurotically, you know, twisted. But your instincts are like, oh, snore. <laughs> exactly. So she sees the image of the dog and then a little dog dose comes into her, which is, yeah. oh, I suddenly feel comforted right. and everything's okay. So the dog is a medicine for the phantasmagoria of horrors that we are, yeah. can get caught up in in our own minds. Should we do another quick one and then we'll we'll go and take a little deeper dive with a few of them? Sure. sure. Okay, here's another quick one. Let's Does this see. one have a title? Um uh this one I called it let me find the a good one to, to do. Um I called this one Bubba Resurrected. <laughs> so this is a woman who's 52 years old. I often dream about my beloved dog, Bubba, who passed away five years ago. During my last dream, I saw that Bubba was resurrected from his grave. I was so happy that I saw that happening. He looked young again and very vibrant. My only agony was that I didn't know how to count how old he was this time around. He passed away when he was 18, and I was wondering if I should count the five years that he, was been, that he had been dead, making him 23, or if I should start over. Both options made me happy. If he was 23, that meant I took really good care of him, and he was one of the most unique and long-lived dogs in the world. The other option meant that he will be having another full life to live with me. I was so happy that he was alive. I felt complete again. Oh. I, I was waking up, though, and realizing it was just a dream, and I became very sad, and I started crying. And she notes that she's currently going through menopause and finds it. She says, this is, these are interesting associations. I also find it difficult to find joy. I'm not experiencing depressive feelings, but I rather find it hard to enjoy things that used to make me happy. I do genuinely miss my dog. I think I am experiencing complicated grief. And one thing I want to say to this dreamer, if she's listening, is that being unable to enjoy things that you used to like is a symptom of depression. Yeah, anhedonia. Yeah, so I, I think you might be underestimating. Uh, I think you might be depressed, is what I want to say to this dreamer and, and would suggest that she uh, look into that, perhaps. A wonderful thing also is that um, for a moment, you you felt joy in your dream. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which is proof that even though when you're awake, you can't imagine your own psyche being oh, able to yeah. generate joy. Yeah. yeah, it really can. Somewhere that joy button is still alive yeah, and well in lovely. you, even though in the waking mind you can't find your handles for that. Yes, and dreams are uh, famously, according to Jung, compensatory. Mm -hmm. So while you're feeling, you know, all these more uh, downhearted, possibly depressive symptoms, the dream maker said, reminds you of the joy and love, connection, right. loving eros, uh, and allows you to wake up and experience consciously the sadness. Sadness is not depression. Mm -hmm. Right. Tears are healing. Exactly. And uh, so look at what a wonderful service the dream maker has provided to you uh, with this image, experience, memory of, of love, attachment, connection, uh, all the things that you write in your comments of happiness and joy. And and Joseph, I'm thinking you, you did a beautiful job a minute ago about talking about how dogs accompany us during a depression. Here's a great example where that shows up in a dream. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there is some depression there. We don't actually know, but, but certainly sadness. All right, let's, let's take a little deeper dive uh, next. Um, the, the ones that we're going to talk about in a little more depth are, uh, are we're doing so because they're, they, they show some themes um, that are uh, common, I think. So 
This one is um, about the dachshund in the cupboard, and it's from a woman who's 31 years old. And she says, I got woken up by this dream in the middle of the night, and I think this is where the dream begins. I moved into a new apartment. A friend and I had been living together, and now I was on my own. My friend was having some conflict in her relationship. She had told her partner something they didn't know yet about another friend, and her partner became angry at this and at her for saying it. Now I was in this new apartment, living alone, thinking about getting more phone chargers and where I would store them. Suddenly, I heard squeaking, barking. I opened a cupboard and found my dog there. He was a very small dachshund. I had left him in there all day while I was at work, in this tiny cupboard. I must have put him in there while moving and forgotten. I forgot all about him. I forgot I even had a dog. I was so ashamed of this. Once I opened the cupboard, I held him close to me, and we were both so glad I was there. He was so shaken. He could talk and said, The phone kept notifying me. Left dad at apartment. I was dad. The dog was calling me dad. My phone, or his phone, was in the cupboard with him, sending him these notifications about us being separated. He was probably barking all day, not knowing where I was. And for context, she notes the following. Four months ago, my partner and I broke up. It still feels very recent and unhealed. My ex and I really loved and connected with this Jungian life and liked talking about our dreams. Back when our relationship was starting to feel more serious, I got to an insecure, fearful place about sharing my dreams, and that fear coincided with a lot of the pets escaping dreams. She notes for main feelings, the guilt and humiliation that I felt in this dream were stronger than any feeling I've ever felt in my life. Wow. It was surprising to see that I could have this strong of a feeling in a dream. I had so much disappointment in myself for forgetting about the dog and treating him this way stuffing him in a closet. When I reconnected with the dog and held him, it was so comforting and loving, like reconnecting with a partner after a long, long time away. And she also notes, I grew up in a very dog-friendly family. We always had one or two dogs at a time. I've always worked as a dog walker, and she says, sorry, I've also worked as a dog walker, and I love them, but don't have one of my own. I'm not in a place in my life where I can have my own, but I would like to one day. Two years ago, I had a series of dreams about other people's pets, often dogs escaping, sometimes biting me, and in one case, comfortably roaming around a fenced-in street. It was always other people's pets, friends whose houses I was in. I don't remember having any dreams about my dog. And dog makes me, this dream makes me feel very emotional. I feel kind of yeah. tearful. Yeah. yeah. Just holding it. Um, you know, just as an uh, overview, uh, people do have dreams about having abandoned a pet uh, with, the, with a theme of, I forgot all about it. I didn't realize I'd been away so long, um, et, et cetera, et cetera. And the the sense of having abandoned a feelingful part of oneself, you know, uh, in the interest of um, leading your life and being reality based and doing the things that make sense. And the abandoned pet shows up to remind us of our feeling and our attachment, and. Uh, what has been lost is the connection to that part of ourselves that is loving and full of life. Uh, and so this happens here that somehow by accident, he got, the dog got locked in a cupboard. And then the reunion of uh, feeling so ashamed and so, so guilty and uh, holding him close is a reuniting with part of herself. And, and you know, the Red Book begins something like, and I wish I had the quote right in front of me, but it, it, the Red Books, Jung's Red Book starts with, my soul, my soul, where are you? Yeah. Yeah. Right. 
So I I am curious to see if you guys have any thoughts about this could have been another kind of animal. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people kittens are featured in this sure. type or babies, of, babies, mm-hmm. babies, We've babies, babies, and dreams. That may Why? be another episode. Not only a dog, but a dachshund. Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to put on the table that I am curious because dachshunds are hunting dogs. They go underground and they hunt badgers. Really? So they were, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh Full size dachshunds are big, and they're really? they like going kill like big badgers under the ground. Um, so to me, I think what seems significant is that she's had this loss. So there's a separation between her and her part, and then she has a dream where a shadow figure has said something to the partner and the partner has become angry and created stress so there's the word the thing that is spoken that creates disharmony the next scene she's single there's something that's been hidden away most importantly when she does find the docs and they're so glad to be together so this capacity to attach comes back. How many times when we lose a relationship, we, we have to harden ourselves up. We get tough. I don't need anybody. I'm not going to think about it. I'm a singular being, which, which we need to do in, in brief or else we'll just you know, bleed out emotionally on the ground. We have to get a little angry, tough. But the thing that's so important to me is that the little one that holds gladness in the reunion is talking about dad leaving. Yeah. And so there's a probably very gentle uh, and very vulnerable story about some wound about dad leaving, an attachment wound between she as a little one, dad leaving, that somehow is, is echoing in the separation and the loss with the partner. He leaving and dad leaving is vibrating down to this really little, vulnerable, sweet part of her, and that she's comforting that part of herself in the dream. But she's also left herself. <laughs> yes, she put away that part of herself. Is what I think. I, yeah, I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that there's been these multiple losses. I really like what you did with dad there. That dad may have left in some way, even if it was just emotionally, the partner left. And in a way, she left herself. That's yeah. it's just these multiple layers. That's really lovely, Joseph. You know, I want to say, too, that um, in DreamWise, Unlocking the Meaning of Your Dreams, which is our new book, which you can pre-order, <laughs> <laughs> and we hope you will. Um, there, you know, th- this is a common theme, Deb, that you talked about, about sort of the abandoned, the forgotten pet or the forgotten child. And there actually is a really lovely dream in DreamWise about a for, forgotten dog, actually forgotten dog and children. Um, there, there are about, a, I think, 160 sample dreams in DreamWise, and many of them come from you, our listeners, as, as uh, this dream I just referenced did. So take a look at that, too. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, the reconnection with the innocent, young, vulnerable part of the self uh, that the animal uh, represents and how important it is to have the reuniting. Okay, let's drill down into another one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, this, is, this is like um, speed dating. It is uh, totally yeah. like speed dating. <laughs> okay. And I am looking for a certain one. Oh, come on. Wouldn't that be hilarious for a speed dating? That. A bunch of people that want to date, but you have to tell you have to tell a dream instead of like anything else you might say. You have five minutes. That's great. Both of you tell a dream, and then you're on to the next. Uh, that is, I think, Joseph. It's Joseph. a million dollar idea, that, man. That is the next reality TV show. That's right. Speed okay. dream dating. Speed dream dating. All right. This next one is called. Um, I called it, so you guys can find it. I called it the Emaciated Dog series, and this is. This is super interesting. You know, one of the things that um, we, we haven't talked about on the podcast yet is the importance of dream series, which I, I really, I hope we can do an episode about that one day. But this is a great example of a series, okay? 
So this comes from a woman in her early 60s. She says, over a period of two and a half years, I had a series of dreams about my dog, who was my companion from the age of 16 through 26. The first dream began with her coming up to me and wagging her tail. I was so happy to see her. It had been so many years since we had been together. But then I realized, oh my God, all this time I had forgotten to feed her and take care of her. (laughs) So I quickly filled a bowl and put it down for her to eat. Each successive dream she came to me, but with each dream she became more emaciated until finally she died at my feet. However, in the final dream of the series, she came back to me all fat and happy, her fur coat all full and luxurious, her deep brown eyes full of love and wisdom. And here's the context. These dreams began shortly after my dissertation research proposal was approved in the spring of 2020 and continued through the research and hardest part of the analysis. Although the research involved individual interviews with a small group of participants, it was also a very personal topic for me. As part of the research process, I had to keep a reflective journal, so there was a record of ongoing personal challenges and insights as the work progressed. Notably, the dream in which my dog was reborn came after the bulk of analysis was complete, and I had just written a draft of the closing sections of the paper. So the main feelings in the dream were, I was so happy to see my sweet dog again, but with each successive dream, I became more distraught and anxious and eventually horrified about her deteriorating condition. The feelings would last for days after each dream. Thinking about those dreams still makes me cry. At first, I thought the dreams and associated emotions were related to the pandemic and lockdowns, which began the same month my research proposal was approved. However, after the final dream in which she returned, I realized that these dreams were more deeply personal. And here's some associations with dogs and other elements of the dream. After the final dream, I began to wonder in earnest what the dream series meant symbolically. As luck would have it, I came across a book by Jungian analyst Eleanor Willoy, friend of Joseph Lee, The Symbol of the Dog and the Human Psyche. Willoy first discusses the nature of the human-dog bond in terms of attachment, where the dog can also serve as a transitional object. This struck me as right on. She also talks about how symbolically the dog is representative of our instinctual nature and, in mythology, often serves as a psychopomp. At this point, I realized that my dog's death and rebirth represented a deep-seated personal transformation as a result of the research process. Notably, my research was about closed adoption, understanding attachment archetypally, and myths and stories that were important to the adoptees' participants as part of their personal experience. So, really profound stuff here. And, and brings in a lot of themes. Uh, well, I think this uh, dreamer has done quite a really good job of, <laughs> of analyzing and understanding uh, her own dream, and I'm... I'm touched by the topic of her research project. Yep. Um, it is a, a topic that is very full of feeling. Um, I, it, 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 adoption and losses and gains and attachment are very much intertwined. And what I um, am most heartened by is that as the streamer's dissertation topic was approved and she engaged in it, that the ending of the dream, the resolution, the lysis, as we say, is that the dog came back all fat and happy, her coat full and luxurious, and her her deep brown eyes full of love and wisdom. And if that's not an image of the psychic journey, the Mm -hmm. streamer, this dreamer was on um, as she had these dreams and undertook her dissertation journey. Um, I don't know what is. Well, it's, it also, I think, lifts up this, this point about dogs uh, 
you know, link with the the underworld, the underworld of death, because there mm-hmm. was a symbolic death and resurrection, and and depression, the underworld of depression. That that she was on this journey, and her her dog was too, and and the the sorrow that she felt for the dog was, of course, sorrow for her own her own attachment, mm-hmm. early early uh, life attachment yeah. wounds. Mm-hmm. It makes me think about how many things we have to set aside in order to take on an enormous project like writing a thesis. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the dog was sacrificed to the great task of writing the thesis. I think one of the things we can take away from the dream is even when we hit the nadir of a point of suffering, very few things in the psyche actually die. Even Mm -hmm. though we're sure that something in us has has suffered unto death. And yet, when the libido is freed up from the great task of the research paper, the water of life diverts again to some other images inside of the psyche, and here perhaps even to one of the symbols of relationship. When I think of my own struggles to write a thesis, our own three of us struggles with our training program, How many relationships, both intimate and otherwise, did we have to pull water away from, uh, pull resource away from in order to just have the time and energy Mm -hmm. to do this reconstructive great task? So I think the dream really offers her an opportunity upon reflection to think about what it cost her to sequester herself to do this writing the kind of suffering that being secluded and focused induces, what parts of her soul went unfed that had to be set aside and maybe even ignored, and what an enormous relief it is to be completed with a Herculean task and being able to rest back into your natural personality and once again tend the things that give you joy and love and wisdom. So the time of sacrifice and austerity has has finished. The labor is done, and now can you flourish again? And the dream is suggesting fat, happy, luxurious love, wisdom. It didn't die. Your life's come back. All the, uh, the austerity of writing the book like John of the Cross, you know, and Patmos, it's over. You know, the good stuff can come back. So, so one of the things I wanted to, to lift up about this dream is how, or these, the series of dreams, is how it relates to some of the dreams you've just looked at, right? The return of a childhood or, or a dog from an earlier time. And we might wonder in those cases about, you know, what was going on in your life and the time that you had the dog who reappears in your dream. There's literally a dog that comes back to life. We've now seen that twice. And also the forgotten dog. Oh, gosh, I forgot about this dog. I've, I, I left it untended for. I mean, I, you know, writing something that's deeply personal, it is a process of psychological work. And what I imagine, purely my fantasy, is that when we've been adopted, there is so much, there's so many unshed tears. There's so much unmetabolized grief especially if the adoption happened early in life, that, that uh, we, we, we just don't, we, we know, I mean, as an infant, you have some sense of my mom was there and then she's not. I mean, it's not a, it can't be a biographical memory, but there's some sense of that. There's some imprint of that. And it, it doesn't get mourned. And my imagination is that this process of writing was a mourning and that the dreams show that process of, of mourning that which wasn't. But but there was a final integration, as there as there often is when we do real deep psychological work. Well said. Yeah. Okay. Let's look at another one. Okay. So this one is called I called it German Shepherd attacking, and I wanted to make sure we got this one in because, um, you know, uh, there's lots of 
most dog dreams, I think, are like the ones we've heard already, where the dog kind of represents a kind of tender part of us that maybe is wounded, that needs our care and love. But this is a very different aspect of of the dog archetype, but an important one, as we discussed earlier. So this is a woman who's 26 years old, and here's the dream. A dark German shepherd dog or something similar was attacking me. It felt like I really knew this dog, like it wasn't just some random dog on the street. It felt personal. I didn't notice any blood or wounds, but that I kept trying to get the dog to see I was an okay human and that it didn't need to attack me. I repeatedly tried to stroke it and calm it, even though I was a little scared, but I tried to hide that fear. It felt like desperation, like my heart was hurting because I wanted it to love me. I think I had tears in my eyes. And she notes, I love dogs. I've grown up with dogs my whole life and feel quite confident with them. Um, And for the context, she says, dealing with grief and the loss of family members, the realization that one day everyone I love will die too, as will I. Getting older and understanding what that means beyond a superficial level, trying to do shadow work and make my darkness more conscious so I can be a better and less angry person, trying to understand my attachment style and also the fear I have of not being good enough for anyone, mostly romantically, but generally too, trying to get over someone who couldn't show up for me in the way I was willing to show up for them. The main feelings in the dream were sad. I just wanted the dog to know that I was okay and I wasn't going to hurt it. I wanted it to see the real me and that I just want to be loved. I also felt scared, but I was very patient and persevered with my efforts. And um, she says, well, maybe the dog is me, the very wounded and hurt part of me who doesn't feel like she can trust anyone. Maybe I know my loyalty. Dogs are usually very loyal, right? And don't expect anyone else to be so loyal. Maybe I expect that people will always hurt me or I have to be cautious. Or maybe the dog is the people who hurt me that I run towards, trying to convince them that I'm lovable and worthy of sticking by for life. So uh, one thing that I think is important is that the dream ego interprets this as being attacked, but she doesn't notice any blood or any wounds. Yep. Which gives me a sense that what we're seeing is that the dog is being aggressive and we're also seeing a dynamic that's really, really primal. That in a pack of dogs, if the alpha dog starts snapping and growling and grabbing, the other dogs who are, if they're not going to challenge, fawn. Mm-hmm. They go on their bellies, they lick, they wag their tails, they become yeah. submissive. And so this primal pattern is absolutely happening in this dream. If we imagined her being another puppy or a dog in the pack, she's doing exactly what one would do in order to be part of the pack, Mm -hmm. to fit in. So my question would be, and I'm not sure what she would make of it is, you know, what does the German shepherd represent in the psyche that is determined to be the dominant in the psychic environment. Mm. Mm. And it is part of her. So something that isn't the ego is saying, I'm in charge. I'm the one that's going to smell out things. I'm going to find the food. I'm going to lead the pack through the wilderness and, and to take care. And, and it, ex, it expects the ego to be subordinate. And the ego, in fact, does play the subordinate role. Don't know whether that's good or bad mm-hmm. for her psychic structure, but yeah. what's playing out is really primal. Yep. What what I'm paying attention to here is our dream ego trying to befriend uh, this dog. And fairy tales teach us all kinds of ways. They're sort of our big collective history of psychic options in a dilemma. You know, we can run away, we can fight, we can trick people, uh, we can befriend. Uh, But what I pay attention to here is uh, our dream ego's uh, insistence on befriending. My heart was hurting because I wanted wanted it to love me. Uh, She's scared, tries to hide the fear. 
And then there's desperation that this loving um, intention has to somehow land. And her comments reflect the same dynamic. Uh, where, whereas I wonder if what it would be like if the dream ego or perhaps our dreamer um, took a more authoritative stance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which builds on what I think you were referring to, Joseph, with the pack, that if uh, you you have to be the leader, you have to be authoritative, you have to be in charge of sit, sit, lie down, stop, of is it necessary somehow to give up the hope for attachment and bonding and affection um, in in order to assert one's own authority, separateness, um, and will. So I'm going to just take that just another notch forward, I think, which is I have this um, hypothesis that's in the associations. She says a lot about I'm loyal. I want to be loved. I just want people to like me. I want to, you know, I, I, I don't know why I'm not loved. But she also says that she's trying to be a less angry person, which tells me that she considers herself to be an angry person. (laughs) And Deb, picking up on picking up on what you're saying, her reaction to the dog is, oh, let me pet you. Let me pet you. But the dog part of her psyche might be looking for a different kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. I mean, stroking and petting and kissing is not the only way to bond. And in really engaging it with some muscularity uh, might be actually what the dog part of her psyche is showed in the dream is looking for, because we might imagine that this is the aggressive, angry part of her. And she, she's, and she's not in a right relationship with it um, because she's expecting it to be docile. And it may be that she's trying to make herself be docile. But the invitation might be, well, could you could you step into the angry dog role a little bit more? You know, if you do that with consciousness, it can be very effective. The last thought I wanted to pick up on, Lisa, which you were inferring, is that um, there's a paradigm in the dream of the alpha aggressive German shepherd and expecting the ego or perhaps anyone else around it to become submissive to it in order to be part of the pack. And yes, the ego might identify with the alpha dog attitude. Maybe that is important for her sometimes or any of the other responses. But there is, from a naturalistic standpoint, there is something troubling about the human ego being subordinate to to the animal. Mm -hmm. So it it may well be that the ego needs to stand up and Take a Caesar Caesar Milan dog whisperer courses, yeah, and uh, feel confident and be able to take that instinctive aggression inside of her and not hurt it, no. but actually harness it. Yes, like, exactly. Figure out how to companion this really vibrant, um, yeah. what could be a positive animus figure. Mm-hmm. So if if the dog was really her ally, it would protect yeah. her, smell right. things out, keep her company. Might be a very like, serious muscular part of her psyche, but yeah. I mean, a well-trained German Shepherd can can be rather a wonderful thing. Oh, I've I have fantasies of having a well-trained German Shepherd because I think as much as they scare me when they belong to someone else, I was like, wouldn't it be great to have one? That's right. It's like having a pet <laughs> dragon. Loyal to you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So um, we hope you've enjoyed the episode. You can check out, there'll be a blog post to go along with the episode uh, that's uh, a little bit more fulsome than our usual show notes with some some extra dreams. And uh, you can read all about dog dreams at dreamwisebook.com. And that'll be on the, on the blog section of the site. And next up, we'll be looking at wedding dreams. So check out dreamwisebook.com, click on dreamography and submit your wedding dream for our next Dreamography episode next month. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, and TikTok.